Jonathan, you and I have had similar lives in approaching the question of parapsychology, anomalous cognition, in that we recognize that if it were real, it would have a significant impact on our understanding of what is reality or what is ultimate reality. Uh, but uh, neither of us had, have made a commitment to its reality. Uh, and uh, all of our uh, psychological and scientific uh, um, antennae are up to, to scrutinize the data. Um, but I, I want to put that aside uh, and ask you, if it were true, if, it, if the phenomena were true, with all that you know about the statistical uncertainty and the difficulty of, uh, of confirming it scientifically, what could be possible mechanisms? I'm not asking you to tell me the mechanisms, but what, what are a range of possible mechanisms that, that could occur? Because physicalists would say when they, when they want to reject the phenomena totally that you know, the data doesn't support it, but it can't support it because it's impossible to work. Well, <clears throat> I think you could make a similar case for qualia, for subjectivity. Like, how can a brain produce subjective first person experience? It seems impossible. No one's come up with an explanation. No one's even come up with a, a remotely feasible explanation. So, if you use. Or they don't even know what an explanation would look like. They don't even know what it looked like. So, if you use the criteria of we need to have an explanation for something or imagine how there could be an explanation yeah, yeah. in order to posit the possibility of something existing, you'd have to rule out subjective experience. You'd yeah. have to conclude that this evident to me experience of first person experience is, is, is not there. So, I don't think that's an acceptable criteria for assessing whether or not things uh, exist. There can be things that exist. In fact, the thing I know best exists, and there's absolutely no possible understanding of how it could uh, exist on the horizon at the moment. At least that's my read of okay. the current literature. Okay, that said, now, what, what would be the range of possible explanations given that as a constraint? Right, so what that means is that in the same way that we need to let our hair down in sort of imagining what possibly could help to explain consciousness, it would be appropriate to let our hair down and imagining what possibly could explain anomalous cognition if it were to exist. And, and I suspect, my hunch, is that those two explanations are gonna be related. Yeah, that would make sense. I suspect if there is anything to anomalous cognition that it has to do with unexplained aspects of the nature of consciousness itself. You know, it's interesting. They talk about time as the flow of time as being an illusion. The past, the present, and the future are all illusions. And yet, in fact, they dismiss the flow of time as being an illusion, much the way they dismiss uh, parapsychology uh, as, as being an illusion. And, but that's not satisfying for me because to me, it seems very clear that we are moving through time. But, and you, you could ask, well, how could you move through time? At what rate are you moving through time? And I would say- One second per second. I would say one subjective moment mm. per uh, unit of time, that there may well be another dimension of existence as real as spatial dimensions, which is a subjective dimension. And that this subjective dimension, the subjective dimension of time, the subjective realm, which is just entirely overlooked by physical science at the moment, may be where the possible realm of anomalous cognition resides. So let me ask you a, a, a question from your examination of, of the data that everything that you've seen, because of the different kinds of anomalous cognition, to me, there's a vast difference between so-called telepathy and precognition. Um, because telepathy, you might be able to come with some extreme physical um, extensions of our physical theory to see how information can be passed from mind to mind without, uh, without sensory. But you can't do it in terms of the future. Um, it, it w without some type of significant violation. Or uh, the exact um, 
uh, or the, the phenomena being independent of existence. So from the data that you've seen, even though it's uncertain as a, an aggregate, can you subcategorize the, uh, the, the, the capacity of time or distance? Are those ever relevant to the studies? Well, first off, it's interesting. Uh, although, uh, Oftentimes when you talk to anomalous cognition researchers, they go, wait a minute, are you sure that's precognition? Yeah. Maybe that's clairvoyance. Maybe you were reading the uh, mind of what the computer was gonna show next. So this sort of interesting thing where these, these different right, phenomena right. actually, it actually turns out to be conceptually right. sometimes difficult to figure out which one of the different possible mechanisms yeah. that, that is works, going on. That's particularly true when people talk about communication with the dead. Yeah, uh, because uh, you you may have you may have a, you may have a retrocognition, or you may have a a, a, a a clairvoyant relationship with somebody who knew that person, as as opposed to actually being in touch with the dead person. Right, exactly. So um, I I think we have to recognize that there, all these sort of uh, anomalous cognition, or as we refer to them as my lab, the woo woo <laughs> kinds of uh, accounts. Uh, there's a lot of interesting sort of overlap. Uh, between them. But I think it's also important to acknowledge that there are lots of real peculiarities in our un peculiarities in nature. Uh, there is quantum entanglement, which has uh, some at least superficial uh, parallels with uh, telepathy. There is the fact that uh, in physics, it's very hard to, uh, the rules go backwards as well as they go forward. Yes, it, admittedly, entropy is going uh, in one direction, but even the fact that entropy is going in this particular direction has to do with the bizarre organization that happened at the very beginning. It's not obvious why that needed to be there uh, in, in the first place. So I always find myself coming back to wanting to really recognize just the remarkable degree to which we don't have it all wrapped up. And as long as we don't have it all wrapped up, that means that there's the real possibility that there may be mechanisms out there, there may be explanations out there, there may be understandings out there that might make a conceptualization of anomalous cognition more plausible. So I think there's a certain arrogance to saying, because right now, we don't understand things sufficiently to imagine how it might exist, that therefore that means that we shouldn't consider its possible existence.